So good afternoon, colleagues online, and uh, for those in Uganda, uh, good morning. For those that are overseas, you're welcome to this webinar. This is the fifth webinar in the 2021 series organized by the National Safe Motherhood Expert Committee. And uh, this webinar is on uh, hepatitis B in pregnancy. We know that this week is uh, we are commemorating the hepatitis B day worldwide and trying to see how we can work towards uh, the elimination of hepatitis B across the globe. So uh, the webinar will be facilitated by a team from Busitema University that is led by Dr. Milton Musaba. But that team is also joined with the um, Mbale Regional Referral Hospital. I will welcome them to take us through this webinar. Please make sure you are mute. Uh, when you have a question or comment, please put it in the chat and keep your videos up so that we can have a good uh, bundle with it throughout the webinar. We'll also be having uh, experience sharing from our colleagues in the UK, how they are managing hepatitis B. So we'll have Dr. Charlotte online soon to hear an experience from the UK. So welcome you again, and we hope you'll enjoy and uh, benefit from this webinar. Over to you, Dr. Milton. As Dr. Milton uh, shares the screen, we just want to remind all our participants that the previous uh, sessions of the webinars have been posted on our, our YouTube channel. We will be sharing the link very soon uh, at the chats. You can feel free to go and check out the material of the previous discussions. Uh, we also make sure that we send the presentations to the emails that have been registered. And uh, to remind so far the medical officers who are on this session that this is a CPD accredited session and other specialists. So during registration, you will request it for your details. I hope you fill them so that you can be awarded the CPD credit, credit units. I think we are good to go. Over to you, Milton. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues, and welcome to this uh, webinar on hepatitis in pregnancy. We are privileged, and the team from Bale sharing this with uh, the rest of the participants. And uh, we'll have uh, about six presenters for this request that we will do this in two batches. We we'll have an initial case presentation, then we'll have a talk about uh, um, management of hepatitis B from the patient's point of view. We'll have a presentation on uh, end screening, and then we'll have a presentation on management of end pregnancy, and then we'll have a view from our international colleagues in the UK, and then that will be followed by a question and answer session. And after that, we we'll go to the programmatic challenges of uh, managing hepatitis uh, uh, in this country and how far we have gone with the implementation of the 2019 guideline from the Ministry of Health. So uh, without wasting any more time, I would like to invite Dr. Martha Jojo She's our medical officer here in the Department of Ops and Gain to do for us a case presentation of a patient that was managed. Is there a particular opinion? Davida 6, Cora 2, Cora 3. Her element was um, 13th of March 2020. Her ETG 20th December 2020. We admitted her on the 2nd of November 2020 at 13.30 hours. She came with um, complaining of labor light pain that had lasted across hours. She was associated with mild vaginal bleeding. She was a known patient of chronic hepatitis B and had been on TDF for a year at that point. She attended ANC in Namatala Health Center 4, which is in Mbale District. At, at Namatala during her, one of her antenatal visits, cervical sacrilege was done. She did antenatal five times, starting from nine weeks of amenorrhea, then months. During her visits, she 
receive folic acid, serous sulfate, got two TT shots, and got monthly IPT. She was treated once for a UTI for a week with erythromycin. And during her fifth ANC visit, she reported nausea that had been on and off for three months. A CBC was then done with other thrombocytopenia. Have didn't come with us results from there. While there, she was started on tranexamic acid, 1,000 milligrams daily for a week, and he didn't get further history of her previous pregnancy. On examination, she was a trial, had no color, had the blood of the knee, had no joint, her blood pressure was 123 per 6 of mercury. The pulse rate was 79 beats per minute. Went on to do an abdominal exam. The fundal height was 34. It was a long line in which presentation. The fetal height was bad. This can be on the vaginal exam. Her os at that point was 2 centimeters. The impression made was a gravidus or a 2 plus 3 term labor with chronic the plan was put on IV dexamethasone, 12 milligrams, be received twice a day for two days. IV tranexamic acid, 1 gram start. Tabs, recovery, 40 milligrams for five days. She was put on dead rest and given magnesium sulfate IV, 20% for grams. Investigations were requested for was a CBC and an obstetric ultrasound scan. For the CBC, significantly there was a thrombocytopenia of 33,000 platelets per microliter. The ultrasound scan revealed that she was 33 weeks, two days. Her estimated fetal weight was 2.1 kilograms and her AFI was 6.5. On the 5th of November, that's three days later, she reported draining of liqueur. Then the cervical stitch was then removed and she was allowed to progress. The following day, when she was reviewed, the fundal height had reduced to 30 over 40 and the os was four centimeters dilated. An ultrasound scan was requested for and it revealed severe oligohydramnios. Decision was then made to deliver the baby by emergency caesarean section. A live baby boy was born who weighed 1.6 kilograms. Um, on the postnatal ward, her first two post-op days were normal. The mother was on cestriotzone, metronidazole, and tramadol. However, on her third and fourth post-op days, Reported increasing abdominal pain with deep tension. Requested for complete blood count, LFTs, RFTs, and electrolytes. Results were not yet got at this time. However, on the fifth post op day at 11 hours, we noticed a reduced urine output. The actual amount was not recorded. Increased abdominal distension still. Tried to follow up on LFTs and RFTs. Her vitals at this point, the blood pressure was 108 over 80 milliliters of mercury. Her pulse rate was 150 per minute. An abdominal ultrasound scan was done and all her organs were normal. However, Peristalysis was reported. Unfortunately, at 15 30 hours the same day, the patient started to gasp and died shortly after. We still had no investigation results. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to
Uh, thank you so much. I, I also want to say that uh, whether I do well or poorly is entirely up to him. Nevertheless, <laughs> 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 uh, I'm going to the boom bucket and I want to just start back. I would like to start by saying that uh, we are all aware that hepatitis B is a very infection that attacks the liver and can cause both acute and um, chronic disease. And that uh, hepatitis B virus infection is a public health problem in several regions of the world and is uh, a matter of public health concern in this country. Uh, mostly, uh, in the World Health Organization, Western regions and African regions have the highest prevalence of, uh, of uh, hepatitis B. We are about 116 million and 81. In Africa, we have about 81 million people uh, who have uh, uh, chronic hepatitis B infection. And it is estimated that about uh, uh, about 296 people uh, were living with uh, chronic hepatitis B infection in 2019, and uh, 1.5 million new infections. Uh, yeah, so this was a huge burden of hepatitis B. In sub-Saharan Africa, it is highly endemic with a prevalence of about between 8 to 18 percent. But in 2019, hepatitis B uh, resulted in about 870,000 deaths. Uh, and these are due to cirrhosis and uh, some due to hepatocellular carcinoma. So these statistics just go ahead to show that we still have a huge problem, uh, both internationally and mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. The map there uh, just shows uh, a bit, it's a pictorial demonstration of uh, the prevalence. We see that the darker, almost like amid green, the real, real dark ones, let me see the darkest color over there, are the highest uh, prevalence areas in uh, areas of uh, West Africa. Especially. Then when you come to Uganda, uh, areas of Sudan, Tanzania, Kenya, East Africa, where we are, we are not so badly off as compared to other areas of uh, West Africa and some other aspects of the Southern African part. Uh, but more interestingly, in the country, um, in Uganda do not know their hepatitis B status. Some people are interested. As colleagues here, whether they know their most recent hepatitis B virus status. Uh, they could know the HIV status, but hepatitis B virus status is very unlikely. So prevalence of HIV infection amongst adults uh, stands at about 4.3%. Uh, it's higher amongst men at 5.6 and slightly lower amongst females at 3.1. Uh, and this is according to the Uganda Population uh, Health HIV Indicator Survey of 2016. But while this looks like still very high, but it has come down from about 10.3% in, uh, in 2005. Uh, later on, colleagues may tell us that we think it's because of the introduction of uh, immunization of, uh, of infants uh, in 2002. But the highest burden is in the northern region at about 4.6 and, uh, and, uh, and northeast, northern, northeast, mainly that's about areas of Karamoja and West Nile. So that upper belt of, of the country, from West Nile, then Northern Uganda, Lama, Acholi, up to aspects of Karamoja, have actually the highest burden of hepatitis B virus in the country. So the rest of the country, um, Bali inclusive here, we are at about uh, the Southwest at 2.7% and East Central uh, is also slightly, slightly lower. Uh, the UBTS data, Uganda Blood Transfusion Service, as part of our responsibility to make sure that we provide safe blood, we screen all uh, our blood donors for hepatitis B. We check for the hepatitis B surface antigen. 
So our data of 2016-2017 uh, indicated that there had been an increase from 1.9% in 2012-2013 to about 2.3% in 2016-2017. Now, this does not seem to tally with the previous observation. Uh, but this is among us blood donors, while the other previous data uh, was a population survey data. And at the highest rates were being registered in Arua at 4.98% and in Bale at 4.21%. So within the region, and uh, this is based on our data, I just want to say that um, Bale region for the blood bank covers uh, Karamoja, Teso, Sebei, uh, Bugisu, and Bukedi. So it's slightly larger than the Bali region in terms of the regional referral hospital. So last financial year, we collected 43,137 units of blood. But of these, 1,687 tested positive hepatitis B. That gave us a prevalence among us blood donors of about 3.9%. Uh, it is observed that the TESO subregion uh, has a, a slightly higher prevalence at about 4%. Uh, at about 6%, TESO subregion has about 6%. Uh, Bukendi subregion has about uh, 4%. And then the Elgon uh, is about 2.5%. And by regional referral hospital serves both uh, Bukendi and, uh, and Elgon. We have different teams collecting blood in these different areas. That's why we are able to segment out that data according to those uh, geographical areas. Uh, amongst females, and most of our, our blood donors uh, of childbearing age, so amongst females, we had, uh, of the 10,096 female donors we had last financial year, 290 said positive hepatitis B, and that gave us about 2.0% prevalence. So it seems to be that, uh, the data seems to indicate that the prevalence of hepatitis B virus is still to be lower among us, the females as compared as compared to men. Nevertheless, as a, as a safe motherhood program or of interest in that area, we still have a number of people to still reach out to, especially bearing in mind that we impregnate our mothers so frequently. So that means uh, we have many mothers delivering. So the 2% while well, may seem a small percentage, but if you factor in the number of mothers who are giving birth, then we have a big problem on our hands. So prevalence among us female donors in Elkhorn region was about 1.9% compared to 2.2% in Bukedi and 4.3%. So this is the trend that uh, Teso subregion still has a higher prevalence than Bukedi and then, and then Elgon. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Kabes. Dr. Kabes had our infectious diseases clinic in Bale and is going to tell us uh, about uh, hepatitis B management. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jessica Kabesu. I'm going to be taking you through the natural history, current practices, diagnosis, and management of hepatitis B. Uh, like it has already been stated, uh, hepatitis B can cause both acute and chronic infections. And the definition of the unacute hepatitis B infection is a uh, uh, new onset hepatitis B infection that may be symptomatic or asymptomatic for a period of less than six months. So when uh, uh, you, one gets an acute infection and it progresses to more than six months uh, with the evidence of a positive hepatitis B surface antigen test that will qualify to be a for chronic hepatitis B infection. But it is important for us to note that chronic hepatitis B infection is not the same or it does not mean uh, chronic liver disease. That is something very important. So, so the mode of transmission of uh, uh, hepatitis B infection is a uh, majorly particle transmission from mother to child. And about 90% of, of, of children who acquire the infection around the time of birth 
uh, will progress to chronic hepatitis infection. A very small percentage of adults, about 5% or less than 6% of them, who develop the acute infection will progress to um, a chronic hepatitis infection. That means that if we are to prevent or eradicate uh, hepatitis B in our population, then we should target interventions around mother and the baby, newly born mother, uh, the newly born child. Yeah, so that is it about the transmission. Yes, once, we develop, once one develops a hepatitis B infection, progression to chronic hepatitis B really depends on uh, the immune status at the point of infection. That's why we are seeing that most of the children and, and infants who, who develop acute hepatitis, 10, uh, only 10% of it resolve the infection. The largest majority of the children, more than 90%, will develop the chronic form of hepatitis B infection. And there are several factors, of course, majorly around the factors are, are, are lying around the immune system. When the immune system is compromised, uh, uh, one will progress from an acute form to the chronic form. But other factors like co-infection with HIV and other, uh, and other viral hepatitis, like uh, hepatitis B, uh, would uh, you know, uh, facilitate progression of the infection to chronic to chronic form. And once one gets chronic hepatitis B, the sequel usually is a, a progression to liver cirrhosis, which can end up with liver failure or hepatocellular carcinoma. Yes, uh, the natural history can, uh, can be divided uh, into, into five phases, which I'll not delve so much into. But uh, we have the acute, the, the, uh, the, the phase one of the chronic infection, phase two of the chronic infection, phase three, phase four, and phase five. And I'll use this diagram basically to highlight the key issue. That in the, in the, the, the phase one, uh, we have a minimal, a minimal inflammation that is taking place in the liver. Why is there minimal inflammation? It's in those people with weak immune system. As you can see on the graph, uh, the viral load, the hepatitis B viral load is colored yellow. And then the ALT, ALT is, the, uh, is an enzyme, alamine aminotransferase in the, in the enzyme. So the presence of ALT means that um, there is damage to the hepatocytes because the immune system is responding to the hepatitis virus that has attacked the liver. So uh, in children or in people who are immune compromised, the, the cell mediated immunity is weak. That is why you are able to see that the, the, the ALT activity in the immune tolerant phase is low because the, T, uh, the, the cell mediated immunity is weak and cannot you know, mount an inflammatory response on the surface of the, but all the hepatocytes. That's why you see uh, a normal uh, or low ALT activity, and yet the viral load is high. So the immune system is not you know, responding. So you, you can see that we have also the immune clearance phase. In patients whose immunity tends to improve, you have uh, inflammation going on on the surface of the hepatocytes, and so there is liver damage, and that's when you begin to see that uh, the, the ALT, the, the enzyme alanine aminotransferase begins to, to increase because there is evidence of damage because of the, uh, 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 the, the competent immune system. Therefore, uh, the presentation with, or the presentation in patients uh, with chronic hepatitis B really depends on whether or not their immune system is, is, is intact. And you can see over there the, the so-called carrier, the carrier stage. Uh, these are these are these are patients with chronic hepatitis B, but it's not causing any damage, and the immune system is not responding, but they are infectious. So there is that other reactivation. You see the re reactivation uh, phase of hepatitis B infection. There are some people who develop uh, hepatitis B infection. And then their immune system tends to, uh, to, to be reactivated. For example, 
uh, HIV patients who are started on ARRT, their immune system improves, and then they were previously uh, asymptomatic, but because of the reactivation, they begin to, to demonstrate evidence of, uh, of, of liver injury. All patients who get uh, co-infected with other causes of hepatitis, like hepatitis C and So the presentation of acute hepatitis B infection uh, is, is non-specific. And in our setting, patients who come with weakness, fever, malaise, anorexia, jaundice, you know, it's difficult for you to, to, to really predict that this is an acute hepatitis. So our, we should just have a high index of suspicion in patients who come in with, with jaundice. But it is important to note that uh, some patients may not present at all with any sign, or any sign and symptom of, uh, of an acute hepatitis infection. And for that reason, sometimes acute hepatitis can be called a silent, silent infection. So chronic hepatitis B infection uh, uh, will present with evidence of, uh, of uh, uh, liver cirrhosis. And in our setting, and generally, we've noted that most of the times we focus on the decompensated cirrhosis where patients come with ascites, the wards they are admitted with encephalopathy, hepatic encephalopathy, or any other upper GI bleeding due to maybe cirrhosis. But there is this other compensated uh, cirrhosis where patients have no clinical signs and symptoms. And uh, studies have actually demonstrated that uh, patients with compensated cirrhosis once quick, once identified early can be provided with preventive management. And can act, can be monitored for early identification of evidence of uh, decompensated cirrhosis, and they are you know they are they are, they are, their survival rates are very good up to 12 years compared to a patient diagnosed with decompensated decompensated liver cirrhosis whose outcome is bad in, the, in one or two years they are most likely to to die. So it is important for us to uh, to emphasize on following up and uh, monitoring patients with decompensated liver cirrhosis. So um, those are the investigations that are important for us to do. Uh, the liver enzymes, I've talked about their significance, the viral load, alpha fetoprotein hepatitis B uh, is, uh, uh, is oncogenic because it integrates its DNA onto the host DNA, and that can cause uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So that's important for us to watch out for. But we also have other non-invasive approaches, like the APRI score, uh, basically, which helps us to, to to, to determine the presence or absence of, fibro, of liver fibrosis. And uh, basically, we look at the ASC uh, from the lab divided by the upper limit of, of the AST in that lab divided by the total platelet count. If it is greater than uh, 2%, that is significant. Uh, that is significant for cirrhosis. Other tests that are important is HIV testing and uh, hepatitis C. HIV, we know that uh, increases the progression of chronic hepatitis B infection. So it is important for us to identify people with, uh, uh, who could potentially be having hepatitis C co HIV infection. But it also has serious implications in terms of treatment because uh, we shall see later on the drugs that we use for treating hepatitis C. Uh, it's important for us to, to appreciate some of the uh, serological uh, uh, events that occur. For example, a patient who, whom you test positive for hepatitis B surface antigen, and the core antigen is also positive, okay? That means that the presence of, a, uh, of the, the antibody to the core antigen, I should have said earlier on that hepatitis virus has got three antigens, the surface antigen, the envelope antigen, and the core antigen. So the presence of the surface antigen plus the presence of the antibody to the core antigen is an indication from that this is a chronic hepatitis B infection, and you don't need to vaccinate this kind of people. All we need to do is evaluate them for eligibility for treatment. So we also have uh, some patients who may have a positive surface antigen, okay, with the immunoglobulin M. That is uh, an indication of uh, of an acute hepatitis B viral infection, and then we have the I'm just sample out one the last the last the last column find someone with a, a negative hepatitis B surface antigen and they don't have any antibodies, 
that have been formed against the hepatitis B. It means that this person has never been exposed to hepatitis B and they don't have any, immune, uh, uh, any immunity against hepatitis B. And these are the group of people that would provide uh, you know, uh, a vaccination against hepatitis B. That's the summary of it. So the goals, um, the goals of treatment, uh, it is true, hepatitis B has no cure. And I've said it earlier on, why does it have no cure? Because part of the DNA of the hepatitis virus is integrated into the host DNA. So the drugs we use cannot eradicate it from the host DNA. So what we do, we give our drugs basically that target the replication of the virus. So the aim is to improve survival and quality of life by preventing disease propagation uh, to liver cirrhosis, first by inhibiting the virus from replicating, and then in turn reducing the progress chronic uh, infection to, to, to cirrhosis. And we also do the treatment for prevention of mother to child element, uh, prevention of mother to child transmission of hepatitis B, and also to prevent and treat uh, hepatitis B virus as, uh, associated extra hepatic manifestations like uh, glomerulonephritis and pancreatitis. So those are the extra hepatic uh, you know, effects of, uh, of hepatitis B virus. Okay, the indications for hepatitis uh, for treatment are, are a bit limited, but uh, HIV co-infection with hepatitis B is an absolute indication. You don't need to do any, you start them straight away with whether or not their viral load is suppressed. Then also uh, a hepatitis, chronic hepatitis B diagnosed with an upper score of greater than two. That is significant for uh, uh, liver cirrhosis. But in case there is any clinical manifestation of chronic liver disease, you may also test and treat them immediately. Otherwise, uh, you can also consider other parameters for initiation of hepatitis B treatment. Uh, for example, um, uh, some, a patient who may have a, a positive envelope antigen, okay, you may, you may consider starting them on, on, on treatment, or patients who have demonstrated persistently elevated uh, ALT, Okay, we are specifically with ALT because it's predominantly intracellular. So those, those could be some of the criteria you use uh, to initiate someone for uh, or, uh. Enofova is the drug of choice and entacavia. Of course, entacavia is used for children two to, two to 12 years and uh, tenofovir for, uh, for adults, uh, for adolescents and adults greater than 12 years who weigh uh, 30 kilograms and above. That is the drug we are using. But we know Tenofovir has got renal toxicity issues. And uh, in other countries, they are using Tenofovir alafenamine, which is more renal friendly. So that is, that is those are the drugs uh, that we can use for management of, of chronic hepatitis infection. Like I earlier on hinted, I, in a setting like ours where hepatitis uh, HIV is of high prevalency, we will get also uh, HIV co-infected patients with hepatitis. So the recommendation is to have a regimen like, which contains tenofova, uh, because tenofova will be active both against the HIV and the hepatitis. But in the event like now we are having increase, increasing uh, rates of resistance of HIV against tenofova, it is advised that you can you, you construct a regimen for the HIV but also maintain tenofovir for the sake of the hepatitis B. So that is something that is important. In an event that you have an HIV patient, for example, who cannot tolerate tenofovir, and if they have resistance to the tenofovir, you can use abacavir, and if tenofovir lafenamide, you can use it. Okay. Okay, basically, uh, the treatment for chronic hepatitis B uh, is largely lifelong, uh, although there are few scenarios, okay? There are very few scenarios when we can, when we, when, uh, there are very few scenarios when uh, treatment can be, uh, for example, if, if one had a baseline uh, up risk score of less than two and they have seroconverted the initially hepatitis, the envelope antigen uh, being, uh, being, being replaced by the anti-hepatitis 
E antigen or someone with an undetectable hepatitis B viral load or someone who has persistently had normal uh, liver function that is the LT. So you may consider uh, to, 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 to discontinue treatment on condition, or, but 12 months 12 months after you found out that, uh, that, that they could be candidates for discontinuation of treatment. Okay. The main aim of treating uh, hepatitis B basically to suppress the virus. And uh, you can uh, monitor response to the treatment by doing your hepatitis B viral loads. But of course, it is important for us to appreciate that you may have people who don't respond to the drug at all, or people who may have partial response, or they may have a condition called a breakthrough. A breakthrough is that those patients whom you, uh, you started on, who were having a high viral load, you start them on antivirals, they suppress the virus, but sometime down a, 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 a long treatment, you find that they, are, they have developed again a high viral load. Probably you want to think of, uh, of resistance or poor adherence to the drugs, or probably the way the patients are covering the drugs is questionable. So those are some of the things you can use to uh, monitor. Very, in very few uh, scenarios, you find uh, hepatitis B surface antigen uh, Turning positive after negative after treatment because we say that this virus is you know, integrated into uh, host DNA, so it may be difficult to totally eradicate the virus. So that is the follow up. Uh, those are the follow up tests. Uh, we are interested in the, the. First of all, you need to do a baseline uh, baseline uh, test, the CBC, LFTs, RFTs, against which you will be used to monitor uh, the patient on hepatitis patient. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jasper Agrespa, uh, Jasper Kabesu, for that elaborate presentation on medical management of hepatitis. One case, transmission is mother to child, vertical. So now we are transitioning into uh, strategies for PMTCT prevention. As I said earlier, ladies and gentlemen, please hang on your questions or post them in the chat. In the next few minutes, we are going to have a Q&A session where we can uh, respond to all those questions. Let me invite Sir Cham Jen Francis, who's the senior nursing officer, but most importantly, she's the area manager of and Guy, so she's our chief whip here. Tell us about NC screening. Sir Cham, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, And this one is just a little midway that as the first of pregnant mothers for hepatitis B contribute to hepatitis B virus. And the four things we do are clinical observation. Our mothers, when they come to the hospital, then a history taking, examination, and starting investigation. The World Health Global Hepatitis Strategy says that may may Milton, I think sister is breaking. We can't hear how well. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a goal to eliminate viral hepatitis as a public health threat by 2030. And our targets are 90% reduction in new cases of chronic hepatitis B and C, 65% reduction in mortality due to hepatitis 
B and hepatitis C infections. We need to achieve 80% of treatment eligibility with hepatitis B and C being targeted globally. World Health Organization, that's under World Health Organization sector strategy. Uh, the mother to child transmission of hepatitis uh, we are, is responsible for two thirds of HBV related liver diseases in Africa. And MTCT is less frequent in Africa, that is 10% than SCR, which is 40%. That is according to the executive summer of April 2018. Screening. Uh, Screening of hepatitis B infection by testing of hepatitis B surface antigen should be performed in each pregnancy of all pregnant mothers, regardless of their previous hepatitis B vaccination or previous negative hepatitis B surface antigen. And the timing should be at the time of admission to the hospital, birth centers, delivery settings, even with women with known unknown surface antigen of hepatitis B status. And those with, uh, who are at risk, like uh, those ones using drugs, mothers with sexually, infect, sexually transmitted infections, and who are on, uh, who, have, who are at risk of getting hepatitis. What is our purpose of screening is to enable early detection of acute or chronic infections to offer treatment to antenatal mothers who require it for their health and to reduce mother to child transmission of infections. Uh, during pregnancy, we need to screen all our mothers who come to antenatal and is done by midwives, obstetricians, general practitioners. We also need to do lab tests to rule out the surface antigen. And this helps us to determine the high infectivity risk, the transmission risk, and the chronicity risk, and also the DNA, the viral load of the what of the virus. Uh, as our mothers come to Antinento, we need to do clinical observation before we touch them. We need to to see them. How are they presenting to us? Do they have jaundice? Do they look pale? Are they tired? Do they look weak? And then we take history. We take histories in antenatal, but majorly we measure on a medical history. We ask our mothers whether they have suffered from STIs, whether they are HIV infected. Then our surgical history, basically blood transfusions, how many times, what was the reason? for the blood transfusion. And then the marital status, alcohol intake, drug use, recent and current injection of drugs. And then uh, on family history, we look at history of hepatitis B in the family, if anybody has ever suffered, hepatocellular carcinoma, or the pattern, if the pattern is HIV, hepatitis B positive. And then in the past obstetrical history, we look at recurrent abortions, their cause and when it they happen. Uh, on the present complaints of the mother, we know that many infections are subclinical, they don't have signs, but mothers may complain of, um, especially in acute infection, they may complain of uh, non specific. Uh, Symptoms like anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and aching of the right upper abdomen. Uh, that is followed by malaise, decreased appetite, joint pains, and jaundice. With the progressive darkening of urine, despite taking of uh, enough fluids and lightening of the face. Uh, in general examination, we normally examine our mother's head to toe, but we majorly look at I uh, want to rule out jaundice and anemia. The, so there are parts of the body that we look at, like the eyes, the mouth, nails, or venous return, then the palms, legs, lungs, and the skin. 
On abdominal examination, we normally inspect, palpate, then auscultate. Inspection, there is excessive abdominal swelling. Mothers complain always pain on the right hand side of, of the abdomen. And on deep pelvic palpation, you find that the liver is always enlarged. Investigations, we are recomm our recommendation is all pregnant women should be tested for HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis B surface antigen at least once and as early as possible. That is first trimester when they come for antenatal or any contact. Other routine blood tests are CBC, hemoglobin to rule out anemia, white cell count to rule out infection. Platelets, high or low, affects clotting of blood. Then urea and creatinine. Uh, screening test for hepatitis B. Uh, you have to do liver function tests, measure certain proteins and enzymes to detect the liver damage. And this one is important for me to, to know because if they are not able to try to what? To, to know these results, that means we are not able to save our mothers. So you find that a bill rubin, total and direct elevation presents, when they're elevated, it presents as jaundice. Then alanine aminotransferase converts protein to energy, and when it's elevated, in it's liver damage. And then the AST enzyme metabolizes amino acids, and when it's elevated, it's a, a muscle or liver disease. And then ALP breaks down protein, and it's elevated in liver disease, and there is bile duct blockage. And the GGT enzyme elevated in the liver or bile duct damage. Then in albumin, protein made in the liver and low levels signifies liver damage. LFT's elevation may indicate inflammatory liver disease like hepatitis, hepatotoxic drugs, if someone is in uh, drugs for a long time, alcohol abuse, cirrhosis, and neoplastic disease like liver cancer. Uh, the laboratory test specific, liver specific, that is uh, the coagulation profile. It increases. When it increases, it indicates that there is liver damage. And then uh, when the clotting, the clotting time exceeds 0 0.8 seconds to one minute, that means we have uh, the INRI is affected and our mothers are bound to bleed. And then the AFP tumor marker ranges 10 to 20 nanograms per mil. And when it's elevated above 500 nanograms per mil, the patient has liver cancer. But this in the normal pregnancy elevates, but not more than 500 nanograms. The serological test for hepatitis B I think this one was uh, Dr. Jasper looked at it uh, in a table for serological tests. So I don't need to talk about it. It is still continuous. And then the APRISCOA also gave us a table on APRISCOA. And uh, I don't need to, to talk much about it. And I think that is all. But also missed out is the ultrasound scan, whereby we look at the liver in our investigations. And that is all I had for you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We will have two more presentations about the management of hepatitis in pregnancy. And then we'll have a Q and A session. And uh, the this is going to be done by our clinical head of department, Dr. Kenneth Mugabe, and then uh, it will be followed by our uh, experiences from the UK by Dr. Charlotte, and then we'll go into a Q&A session. So please, note your questions somewhere, or write them up in the chat, and we'll get to you shortly.
sistem yapıyor. Evet. Thank you, Milton. Milton. Yeah, we are going to look at uh, management. Guys, uh, been pregnancy. Uh, you may be asking yourself, why are we bothered with management? Uh, like you had uh, from uh, my colleague, Dr. Bomba, is uh, uh, quite prevalent. Uh, in our session in uh, the Elgon region, it's uh, about two uh, percent of the population. But I, I want to inform you that uh, uh, there's some data from uh, Nato Police as well. Uh, in the previous studies, I think which were published last year, uh, uh, there's our Nato Clinics. Uh, if you look at the Kayondo study, which was done in our National Referral Hospital. I think the prevalence there was about uh, of hepatitis C in a natal clinic was about 2.9 percent. And uh, when you look at also study uh, by our Chola and colleagues, I think the Zira Regional Referral Hospital is at about 11.8 point, uh, point, uh, percent. And um, so it is uh, in our natal clinics. So it is that high uh, in our natal clinics compared to. Or compared to the population uh, uh, of the blood group. So it's very important for us and pertinent to talk about hepatitis C in pregnancy. And I'll be dealing with uh, guidelines majorly. So I'll, uh, during this discussion, I'll labor to uh, link the natural history of uh, hepatitis B to pregnancy and its outcomes. Then uh, testing has been dealt with. Uh, by my previous uh, uh, presenters, then I'll look at uh, of uh, particle transmission, and then we we'll look at also other uh, and postnatal care. So we, we do care for these pregnant mothers with who are risk of hepatitis B infection uh, because we need to detect uh, chronic hepatitis B virus infection. I uh, about and diagnose. Then also we need to provide I need to communicate also to uh, to the mothers and the family members on um, how how they are to detect how they are to, how they they come to know about uh, possibility of them having hepatitis B. Then it's very important. Also, very important for us to do appropriate investigations in hepatitis B serving uh, again positive mothers to determine whether they are eligible for treatment or for or just follow up. Then, of course, uh, prevention of mother to child transmission. Now, uh, when you look at the natural history and its uh, impact on pregnancy and outcomes, most of the data that we tend to see are published is uh, a bit conflicting. Whereas earlier studies showed that uh, uh, when a mother is pregnant and she has hepatitis B, uh, the liver disease that she had doesn't worsen. But uh, from recent studies, we are starting to see uh, some case reports about that tend to suggest that in these mothers, we have uh, reactivation, uh, hepatic exacerbation, and also permanent liver failure. And uh, when, when you have uh, uh, the liver being damaged, uh, sometimes uh, we, we have imbalances, hormonal imbalances, reproductive hormonal imbalances, and uh, which most of these reports have uh, reported. And these ones have significant, have short significant effects, adverse effects or outcomes on pregnancy. And uh, most of these reports have, uh, uh, declared or they have reported things like preterm birth, diabetes, antepartum hemorrhage, uh, and things like that. So it's very important for us to call up mothers who we screen in a clinic and we find their rights to be suffering as gen positive. Uh, the screening has extensively been talked about, so I won't dwell on it much, but uh, the guideline we have in our setting 
in Uganda is that whenever women come to us in our natal clinics, we are meant to, uh, on top of uh, screening them for uh, HIV and the other sexual transmitted infection, we should be keen to screen with hepatitis using the surface antigen. But one thing that is missing is that we should not only screen during antenatal, but we should also be keen to screen these mothers for hepatitis B surface antigen at admission to deliver. Why do, we, why do I say that? Uh, if you look at uh, most of our antenatal uh, reports or studies in Uganda, you find that we are only screening about 8% of our mothers. 8%, that is a very small percentage. That means that majority of our mothers come to deliver without being screened for hepatitis B virus. So let's begin thinking about not only screening these mothers within a clinical clinic, the first visit, but also bother to ask them when they come for delivery. Were you screened? And if they are not being screened, then we should screen them at that point. Hepatitis B then surface antigen. So the others have been built on. I won't uh, go back to them. But what is important is that. Uh, if we find them positive for surface antigen uh, during our natal clinic, uh, we have to do viral loads. Uh, we do hepatitis B DNA uh, levels. We have to do envelope antigen, and also we have to see if they have uh, liver injury. So we do the uh, liver enzyme alanine amino transferase. This we do at uh, baseline, that is the first admittal visit, which we assume should be in the first trimester, and also as 28 weeks. That's what our guidelines say. And uh, in case you find this mother, in case you find this pregnant mother is positive, then we have to follow up and screen uh, her sexual contacts and household members. So this is also a gap that we tend to see in an admittal really follow up. We shall be hearing it maybe from the next uh, uh, problematic uh, uh, presenters. Then uh, what is important is that the specialist should be involved in the care of these mothers uh, uh, right from antenatal up to delivery. So when we, when we are looking at the current guidelines, uh, we base on uh, the disease, uh, we, we try to assess the stage of the disease as uh, one of my presenters was saying. And uh, when we are assessing the disease, we depend on the biological, we depend on the serological status and the degree of disease, as uh, it was said. But uh, some colleagues uh, uh, have also suggested that uh, there are some other parameters that we can also use uh, when we are trying to assess these pregnant mothers. We are talked about uh, in case somebody has a threatened preterm, uh, somebody has threatened preterm labor. They think that uh, if the mother has threatened preterm labor, this one may disrupt uh, placental function. And uh, when it disrupts placental function, it uh, leads to placental leakages. And these leakages lead uh, to child transmission. So they think that maybe uh, this kind of uh, parameter should also be used when we are assessing these mothers uh, for initiating uh, treatment. The other, the other uh, parameter is uh, if uh, this pregnant mother or this mother was come to you as the uh, failed immuno or prophylactic, maybe uh, we should also consider that as a parameter uh, of starting treatment. But, uh, you know, most of these outcomes of, of this research have been done in uh, very small numbers. Uh, the powers are, are, are not uh, strong enough uh, to warrant guide, and there's no guideline actually to this effect. So we based on the other uh, uh, on the other parameters that have been discussed before. So the options for treatment of our pregnant mothers usually we depend on nucleoside analogs, uh, which we have from previous presenters. Then there is interferon, uh, that is also very useful in our setting. And uh, when we are talking about 
hepatitis B and C in a complicated that begins in antenatal pregnancy. No. Pregnancy actually begins with planning in the preconception period. So when we are managing hepatitis B virus, we should think about it from the preconception period, pregnancy, and then the postpartum period. And uh, the recommendation here is that uh, antitrovirals in the preconception period usually are reason being that most of uh, uh, most individuals who have hepatitis B during this period, uh, it is not uh, active, not, uh, active. So we usually don't give antitrovirals. But in some instances, Give, we may start antitrovirals uh, in the preconception period because we tend to fear, we tend to want to prevent flares during pregnancy. So, in the case uh, we need to start antitrovirals uh, in the preconception period, we need to talk to the mother or we need to talk to the couple, and they should be willing to wait for 18 months so they can conceive. And these 18 months are between two the 12 months of therapy and then also six months of assessing therapy uh, prior to the conceiving. And the, the drug of choice during this period is the interferon injectable. And, uh, uh, and this one, the interferon injectable usually is the, uh, the, the one with the PEG uh, type. Uh, and uh, we usually prefer the interferon because compared to other antivirus because interferon gives better clinical remission and also better conversion. The type is uh, the antigen is better compared to nucleoside, nucleoside analog. Um, but remember that interferon is, is, is separated in pregnancy, so we have to stop it uh, before somebody gets pregnant. So what is the guideline in case somebody gets pregnant? In case somebody gets pregnant, we have to switch to the nucleoside, nucleoside analogs. And uh, these ones, like uh, our previous presenters stated, they, they, how they work is that they inhibit the polymerase and the replication of the virus and lead to lactic acidosis and uh, instead doing or the stop replication or death of the virus. Um, during pregnancy, we have to give anti uh, sorry antiviral drugs, antiviral drugs. Tenofovir, OTDF is the drug of choice, and uh, we usually give three hundred milligrams per day. And this one, according to the Ministry of Health guidelines. Which we start uh, giving tenofovir at 24. Whereas WHO recommends 28, starting from 28 weeks. As a country, we, 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 we uh, decided to start from 24 weeks because we tend to see uh, some babies survive from 24 weeks. Our, our age of diabetes is reducing as a nation from 28 downwards up to 24 weeks. So, the recommendations start uh, tenofovir from 24 weeks. Uh, and then uh, in case somebody has a um, uh, renal disease, renal disease, tenofovir won't be the best have to use and take up. And then that is the one milligram per day. Uh, Telbividine tel and lamividine can be alternative. However, they have a low uh, resistance we tend not to use uh, lamivudine and telbividine because of the low resistance barrier. However, if you put in a corner and you don't have telephobia, you can use uh, lamivudine, but it should be used in a trimester. So during delivery, there are also key things that we have to uh, we have to do that we have to take care of. One of them is uh, things that can uh, potentiate Facilitate maternal transmission of hepatitis B virus. One of them is that 
we in case someone comes in and has a spontaneous rupture the condition of labor then also in case you you try to delay that until uh, an advanced stage when you think uh, delivery is imminent. Um, then we try to avoid because the associated with a lot of maternal trauma. And when uh, this trauma happens, the risk of child transitional types behavior. So we try to avoid that. Mode of delivery, usually, the recommendation is uh, that if that's the infection does not alter our mode of delivery we we use the usual obstetric indications and that is uh, as a result of the studies we have done that have shown that actually there is no uh, impact or there is no difference in uh, perinatal transmission of hepatitis b whether you do a c section or uh, vaginal delivery so don't use hepatitis b as a an indication being a C section. In the postpartum period, uh, the recommendation is that uh, we continue with the turn off over for zero to three months. Sometimes we stop at uh, the time when the mother has completed delivery. At times we continue for three months. But as a, as a country, uh, our guideline is that we continue for three months. Otherwise, um, the decision to continue depends on uh, what was your indication for starting the treatment, what was the type B surface antigen positivity, and whether the mother breastfeed or not. Then, if we are to discontinue, when, or when we discontinue, we need to continue monitoring this mother for potential layers of hepatitis B virus. And when we are monitoring this mother, this mother, we usually uh, monitor. Uh, the liver the liver injury. We uh, and and this one, of course, we we, we most we are interested in elevation of and amniotransferase. Yes, the other one, the aspartate uh, amniotransferase, not uh, because it can also be secreted by like this muscle that cuts uh, uh, from the heart. So it's not entirely from the so we, we do this monitoring from four weeks. We do at four weeks, at eight weeks, 12, and 24 weeks. Then after that, we do annually, the LFTs. The other thing we monitor is the viral load. Viral load, the flight is built at six months and 12. Then when we look at prevention of mother to child transmission, uh, we must combine uh, what we are giving the mother, the antiviral treatment mother, with uh, treatment of the of our infants. Currently, WHO recommends that we do universal vaccination for hepatitis B virus, including a birth dose in all hepatitis B endemic countries like Uganda. What 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 is happening in most sub-Saharan countries is that. We give the pentavalent uh, vi uh, vaccine at six, 10, and 14 weeks. Not so. But the recommendation is we should be giving uh, the hepatitis B vaccine as a universal, you know, universal to all newborns. And we should be giving it starting from birth. Uh, this one should be given within the first 24 hours of delivery the baby, but ideally in the first 12 hours, if possible. Uh, this one can be coupled with uh, hepatitis B immunoglobulin, if, it, if you can access it, because most studies have seen that if you give the hepatitis B vaccine within the first 24 hours, and then you add the immunoglobulin, you are able to prevent maternal child transmission by 80 to 95%. So, uh, if, if available, you can give immunoglobulin. But what should be uh, at least not miss is the uh, birth dose, the HBV vaccine, the monovalent one. 
Then after you've given the birth dose monovalent, then you can follow it up with the other two or three doses, the pentavalent vaccine to complete the slaves. And uh, in case you give the immunoglobulin, this one will only provide immunity for the next six months. Beyond that, there's no benefit of giving the immunoglobulin. Um, usually, uh, if, if you look at the barriers, which one of, uh, of course, the discussant would look at barriers to uh, eradication of vert this vertical transmission, that in, in our programs, we have, tend to have underutilization of this immunoprophylaxis uh, with hepatitis B vaccination and immunoglobulin. Leave alone the screening during antenatal, okay, which is very low, and also no screening at all at the time of uh, admission of delivery, but also immunoprophylaxis at, at, at birth with the vaccine is non existent. The other thing is that some, some of these, when some of these children, when given the immunoprophylaxis, they have documented some of these uh, ones. So those are some of the barriers. If we talk about breastfeeding, some, some, some people may ask if someone has hepatitis B, can they breastfeed their ch children? Yes. The guideline is that uh, we should encourage mothers to breastfeed even when they have hepatitis B virus. The only time when we do not recommend or when we should avoid breastfeeding is in the presence of cracked or bleeding nipples. And uh, this is just because that when these mothers have cracked nipples, uh, they exude this virus in the serous uh, fluid that uh, comes from those injuries. And this is where they are able to transmit the virus. So it's only in the presence of cracked that we avoid breastfeeding. Otherwise, there's no risk of transmitting the virus to breastfeeding. Then when we go to contraception, usually the, the, the contraceptions of uh, contraceptive methods of choice are the progesterone only contraceptive system. The ones that have estrogen contraindicated because the estrogen component is associated with uh, acute liver disease. Uh, sorry, uh, in the, the estrogen component in the, in the presence of acute liver disease is associated with the cholestasis and uh, so because of that, uh, we are hesitant to give uh, estrogen containing contraceptives. Then um, the, the IUDs and barrier methods have recorded low efficacy rates. So you may see uh, pregnancy coming up with these mothers who use barrier methods. So uh, hepatitis B virus, we tend to prefer the progesterone only contraceptive. So in summary, some summary recommendation. One, that all pregnant women must be tested for or screened for hepatitis B surface antigen. This should be done in our, on the first antenatal visit in antenatal care and uh, also uh, when a mother presents to us in the labor ward, okay, when she's in labor, if she has not done, if she has not screened for this, please let's screen with mothers. The second is that all infants must receive their first dose of uh, hepatitis B vaccine as soon as possible after birth. We said preferably in the first 24 hours. And then there, thereafter, they can complete their usual series of intervalent vaccine. And in case you have access to the immunoglobulin, you can administer in the first 12 hours. That is the WHO. But in the national guidelines, the immunoglobulin can be administered in the first 72 hours. Of course, this one has dramatic challenges. Consideration, the usual delays that we usually have. The third guideline in summary is that delivery of hepatitis B vaccine within 24 hours of birth should be a performance indicator for all Yes, our ADHOs. So that third uh, guideline that to be able to enforce or to be able to, to foster uh, people to be giving this uh, single dose birth uh, HBV vaccine 
within 24 hours, it should be uh, a performance indicator for any management programs. You should advocate for that. Then uh, the other one is that we usually consider an offer therapy as first line. Uh, from uh, 24 weeks, the Ugandan perspective, and 28 weeks, the WHO, to at least uh, three months in our perspective after delivery to Uganda. Then uh, last, last but not least, in the app, if you are unable to do uh, the viral loads in antenatal, or when you're trying to monitor the mother, you can use the envelope antigen uh, to do assessment, see if this mother deserves to be treated or you monitor the mother who is on treatment. Thank you. Let me take this opportunity to thank the president for that elaborate presentation. We are going to have one more presentation from Dr. Charlotte, who is a consultant of the Eastern in Cambridge with 18 years of experience in maternal medicine. And in the last five years, she's been doing work with the Awempe National Referral Hospital and Mulago uh, Nas National Women's Specialized. Dr. Charlotte, please, the floor is yours. You can share your screen and then we will have a Q&A. Um, well, thank you very much indeed for asking me to talk. I have to say it's been a really fascinating meeting and very well organized. Um, when I was asked to talk about hepatitis B in pregnancy, I have to say, I did first think, what was I going to talk about? And I think, having listened to you, I've understood why. I think it's mainly because hepatitis B and, uh, is a very different disease in the UK, um, primarily because our numbers are so much lower. And it is very rare for us to see anybody uh, in pregnancy with advanced chronic hepatitis B, um, and certainly with liver disease. So I actually don't remember the last time I saw anybody uh, who had advanced liver disease due to hepatitis B uh, while they were pregnant. So really in the UK, uh, hepatitis B is, is all about prevention. Um, and um, the, we've had a, a fairly well-established screening program uh, for a long time. I started in obstetrics in the 1990s. Um, and since then we have been offering all women um, screening for hepatitis B in pregnancy. Initially when I started, it was a slightly haphazard thing and that each hospital would do something slightly different. But since uh, 2000, um, we have had a United Kingdom National Screening Committee, uh, which monitors and oversees screening in all hospitals in the UK. And they have recommended that all eligible pregnant women should be offered and recommended screening for HIV, hepatitis B and syphilis in pregnancy. We then have to report back our data um, to the UK Screening Committee uh, uh, each, each month. So each hospital will do that, where they will submit the data of the number of women that were eligible to be screened, the number of women that were screened, um, and then the outcomes for the babies. So, so in the last data that we have from 2019 to 20 in the UK, 99.8% um, of eligible pregnant women were screened, which is quite an amazing number now. So really pretty much every pregnant woman in the UK is now screened for hepatitis B. Um, and as we've discussed throughout this meeting, uh, the, the real importance of that is that we can, if, if we can identify the women, uh, then hopefully we can uh, prevent transmission to the baby and therefore prevent chronic hepatitis B in the future. Our numbers are, are just much, much smaller than you. In, in 2019, um, 3.77 women per thousand tested positive. So that's about 0.3% of the women in the UK uh, were testing positive for hepatitis B. So, you know, our numbers are, are just uh, tenfold less than you. And again, that, that really um, explains why I don't really see hepatitis B hardly at all. Um, and uh, it is, it's increasingly less of a problem. If we look at uh, the, the effectiveness of, of the screening program, uh, we also, uh, our last speaker talked about um, uh, data on, on, on vaccinations and how important that was and how that should be one of the, 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 metric, the metrics that we should be using to evaluate our programs. Um, and uh, currently in the UK, 98.5% of babies who needed to have hepatitis B vaccine got it within 24 hours. Um, and on the bottom of my slide, you may not be able to see um, just nearly 96% of babies who required immunoglo immunoglobulins uh, receive those within 24 hours. So we really are doing very well now um, in managing to screen the mothers, uh, pick up the ones who are positive, um, and then uh, treat the babies or give the babies prophylaxis early uh, in, in, in the first 24 hours of life um, to try and decrease the chance of, of transmission of hepatitis B. How do we implement that? Well, in, in the UK, what happens is that all women, um, are, what most women in, in the UK, once they miss a period, will do a pregnancy test. 
and then will uh, report to their family doctor that they think they're pregnant. Um, and then they will be put into the midwifery system within the UK and uh, a midwife in their local area will arrange to meet either virtually or in person with the woman, uh, usually somewhere around about six to eight weeks after, they, after their last menstrual period. Um, and at that first visit, uh, screening will be offered to, to all women. Um, and that will include screening for infectious diseases that we discussed, but also screening for other things as well, the full blood count and other things that we would normally do. So the, the aim is to get the bloods taken and the results back by 10 weeks gestation, um, which is very early, um, but is, 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 is successful in a lot of women. We obviously have to respect women's um, uh, choices and some women may decline screening. If they do decline screening, we have to make sure that that choice is, is respected. But also I think we need to make sure that we understand why women decline, because I think there are a number of reasons and it tends to be either because they don't understand what, why we're doing it, um, they don't understand what the potential risks are, um, or they think that uh, they can't be positive because they are not in a risk group. Um, and we all know that uh, despite the fact that some people don't feel they're at risk, they, 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 they still may be positive. So usually speaking, if you make sure you explain clearly enough to the women, uh, the women will be happy, happy to have screening. And so the vast majority of women now will, 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 will take up screening and hopefully understand that we're not doing this as a sort of, uh, as trying to find out they have a bad problem, but actually trying to support them and, and decrease the risk to their babies. We are then supposed to offer repeat screening to all women at 28 weeks if they have risk factors. So that would be things like IV drug users or if they have sexually transmitted infections, uh, we should be offering repeat screening at 28 weeks. And I don't think we're as good at that as we are as, at, at getting the, the initial screening done. And that is not actually reported. So that's probably why we're not as good at it because we have to report uh, the early screening. Um, and, um, and that helps uh, focus our minds perhaps because it, we, are, we are judged as a hospital um, on how our screening program and how, on how effective our screening program is. Um, and if we aren't doing it effectively, um, then we may have recognition taken away from us as a maternity hospital. In terms of management of it in pregnancy, um, if a woman does have a positive screen report uh, results, um, so all negative screen results are usually just sent to the mother. If you have a positive screen result, uh, then you will be uh, phoned up usually by a midwife within the hospital that you're being cared for um, to have a discussion about that result um, and to talk about what would happen next. Quite often the positive screens are actually mothers who already knew they were hepatitis B, but they were having, we, we, often the bloods are taken as, as, as one batch for HIV and syphilis and hepatitis B and they just get them all done together. They may not have disclosed it, but they may know already. Uh, but obviously some of these will be, be women who didn't know beforehand. And so it's very important that we make sure they understand um, why we've done it and, and what the results are and what they may mean. And, and then depending on what they need, they will either be referred to a hepatologist, to an obstetrician and or a neonatologist. Uh, all women who have hepatitis B would be expected to be referred to a hepatologist at some point if they aren't on, 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 under them already. Um, and then the hepatologist will take over the treatment of the mother for us. Um, actually treating them in exactly the same way as you would in Uganda uh, with, uh, depending on their, their viral load and their status, um, with uh, antiviral drugs if required. Um, some of them may already be on the antiviral drugs so having been on them prior to pregnancy. The obstetrician will be there just to talk to them about the fact about what we, what we will be, we'll be doing and how we manage the labour. And the, the neonatologist is just involved if, if necessary to make a plan for the baby afterwards, or that's usually just done via a letter rather than actually seeing the mother. In terms of our management of pregnancy and labour, then really they're managed uh, exactly the same as other women. Um, it, as we have already discussed, there is no indication for caesarean section for hepatitis B. Uh, we would encourage mothers to aim for a vaginal delivery. Um, in terms of safety, uh, all healthcare workers are also vaccinated against hepatitis B, but we would advise the healthcare workers to take universal precautions in labour um, to, to decrease the risk of, 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 of transmission. Um, in the same way as you would do if the mother comes in with ruptured membranes, we would uh, uh, intervene early rather than waiting, um, and we tend to try and avoid rupturing the membranes until late in labour. Uh, th th that's the one thing we would not we would differently here is that uh, in terms of fetal monitoring, uh, we usually monitor the babies by an external monitor, but we would want to avoid uh, using an internal monitor. We have a thing called a fetal scalp electrode, which has a little uh, clip in it that attaches onto the baby's head. Um, and we occasionally do fetal blood sampling, so taking a small blood sample from the baby's head by scratching the baby's head with a, with a, with a sharp blade. Um, and those kind of things would want to be avoided in a mother with hepatitis B uh, to decrease the mother child transmission risks during labour. And again, we would try to avoid a, a difficult instrumental delivery um, to avoid, uh, again, the, the, the breaking of the skin and, and the mother child transmission. What we would hope to do is, is to make sure that before the baby is born, uh, we know what treatment the baby is going to need. 
and that will be based on the infectivity of the mother so that we have that available before whether we, we know whether it's going to be just the hepatitis B vaccine or whether they require the immunoglobulins as well. Uh, the immunoglobulins have to be um, released on, on an individual basis so, so knowing that the baby is going to be born beforehand we can make sure they're available in the hospital um, and on the delivery unit so that when the baby is born um, that, that they, will, they will be named kept available for them in a fridge so they can be given to the baby um, as soon as the baby's born, as soon as soon as possible after the baby's born. The management of the neonate, um, I think we've discussed a lot of this earlier, but really there's a sort of, this is a, a just a little table that shows, shows what we would give. Um, the vast majority of our mothers actually fall into the one where the mother is hep B surfacin antigen positive, but anti-HBE um, a positive as well. So, so actually the most, whilst, whilst, the, whilst in looking at that table, it looks like lots of uh, women, lots of babies would require immunoglobulins. Actually, uh, in, 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 in reality, uh, most of our mothers fall into the category where the baby just requires the vaccine um, and does not require the immunoglobulins. Um, and that I think would, I can't tell you the, the, the actual proportion, but that would certainly account for the vast majority of our mothers. I think the, the bit where we are behind you um, in, in, in terms of prevention of hepatitis B is the, is the neonatal, the newborn screening, uh, the newborn vaccination program. Um, we do now offer all babies uh, hepatitis B vaccination at 8, 12 and 16 weeks as part of our newborn vaccination programme, but that's only been going since 2017. So, so any child born prior to 2017, born to, born to a, a low risk mother who did not have hepatitis B, will not have received a vaccination. Um, and currently we're not uh, vaccinating uh, older children or, or, or adults um, to catch up with that. So that's, I think, the, the one thing that we are, we are behind on at the moment um, in terms of of, of picking up that, that population um, whose mothers were, 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 were negative at, at, at delivery um, and, and, and so therefore they are still therefore vulnerable to hepatitis B in the future. Uh, a lot of people will be vaccinated if you're a healthcare worker, uh, if you've travelled you may well be vaccinated, um, but we do not have a, a population vaccination programme for hepatitis B at the moment um, and that's something I think that we, we may well have to look in the future, but hopefully uh, all babies now coming through the vaccination programme um, will have been uh, will have been offered vaccination as, as, as part of their 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 their, their, their newborn vaccination program. So that's a really uh, a very short um, summary of what happens in the UK. And I think, as I say, I think the real the real major difference here is the prevalence is so much lower um, that uh, that we see it very rarely. Um, and I and I and I, I think I'm very fortunate in that I have a lot of colleagues who work uh, with me. So we have you know, screening midwives, uh, hepatologists, the, the neonatologists, and there's a very well um, drawn up guidelines and performers that we, we follow and, it, and, it, and, and by the looks of the, of the statistics uh, most of the time it's working very well uh, and we are managing to pick up the mothers who, who are at risk uh, and therefore pick up the babies who are at risk and hopefully prevent hepatitis B in the future um, in the UK. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much uh, Dr Charlotte for that uh, presentation and uh, showing that where we should be going. Uh, we are now into the Q&A session, and I'll ask the Dr. Lado Emmanuel to help us with this Q&A session. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Dr. Richard is going to take note of those who raise, who are raising their hands and who have uh, audible questions to ask the panelists. I will go through the chat, and at intervals, we'll be reading maybe one or two questions from, uh, from the chat. And as well, feel free, if you're among the panelists, to actually respond some of these questions at the chat so that we can have uh, quicker responses. Over to you, Richard. Okay, so colleagues, if you have a question, just raise your hand. We'll attend to those first, and then we'll go to the chat. I All see right, a hand I... from uh, Dr. Henry Sembatia. Go ahead and mute and straight to the question, please. The presentation, I'm sorry, I was in and out, but uh, in this session, if you found the mother was hepatitis B positive, would you go ahead and treat? Would you refer to a hepatologist? What would be your next course of action? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, we'll take one more. Nagawa Proskovia, go ahead. Thank you very much, the presenters. My question is, if a baby is exposed to hepatitis B, meaning the mother is hepatitis B positive, at what age should we test this baby, like to rule out that she or he never contracted the virus from the mother, and this baby completed all the vaccines, the routine in the immunity schedule? Thank you. OK. 
Okay, so those are the hands we had, Delado. So, all right. So I think. Uh, do you want to answer them? Yes. We are, we, are, we are saying that uh, starting, treat, starting treatment for any pregnant mother who is a paritis G7 agent positive starts from 24 weeks gestation and the, the, the drug of choice is tenofovir. If she does not have uh, a renal disease, but if she has renal disease, we have to opt out of tenofovir and we use intercal. And then we do this uh, we do this up to three months after delivery. Uh, so we don't have that luxury of referring to hepat hepatologists and what, but uh, we also uh, try to manage these patients as a team. So uh, uh, frequently we, or regularly we, we invite in the uh, physicians uh, so, so that we uh, can manage these patients better. Identified early hepatitis B infection so that they are monitored and managed appropriately. However, within nine months, uh, we should be able to identify, we should be able to do hepatitis test. But if we give it uh, the vaccine at birth or anywhere around them at birth, you can do the hepatitis B surface antigen test one month out. <laughs> but the most important intervention is the birth dose and the immunoglobulin. That's the most important at birth. All right. Okay. Uh, I think we had a question from Eddie Cantong in the chat. He was asking about what uh, what was the probable cause of death of the mother? Uh, I think when Dr. Martha presented, and then uh, there was another question from Ann Mujisha, who was asking what happened to the baby after the delivery. I think they didn't hear much. <clears throat> and then uh, there was a Kanike Andrew asked about, this was to Dr. Martha again, were you able to get the LFTs and RFTs after the patient uh, passed on? David Wall Nang asked, after the audit, what was the likely cause of death? Was a post-mortem done? And then the final question before we can have another group of audible, I mean, people to ask. Uh, from Anne Mujish again, uh, she was asking, a gravida 6 para 2 plus 3 with chronic hepatitis B. Could we hear more about the obstetric history, especially the two abortions? Could this patient have been a candidate of an elective Caesar? Back to you, Richard. Thank you for the question. For the cause of death and the postmortem, that was not done. And about the, the, the investigations, especially the LFTs and the RFTs, we were not able to retrieve them. So this was an old file where we went back to retrieve all this information. And that is all the information I found in the file at that point. So those results were still not available at that point. For the baby, the baby was taken to the neonatal unit and they took it on from there. The details, I don't have what went ahead with the baby. Thank you. Richard, I think you have some hands. Do you want to give them a chance? Yes, we have, uh, let's have Mary Goretti, Nam Soke. Yes, please. Thanks for the presentation. I would like to thank all the presenters. My question is, in case is what, what should we do? And she's like, you test and she's positive. It is be positive. Positive and secondly, I would like to be clarified with the baby born to a post a hepatitis B positive mother. Should that baby be immunized? Or oh, I didn't get you, I didn't get a doctor. Well, I would need clarity on that. Thank you. All, all right, we didn't hear very well. I hope the 
presenters had that, but you can type as well in the chat. Eric, Eric. Yes, uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you, the presenters. I would like to know uh, in a situation where uh, uh, a, a, a woman is negative and the husband is hepatitis B positive and on treatment, is there a role for uh, a booster dose to, to a woman? And if so, when, when should it be given? Thank you. Great, we'll take one more. That's Juliet. Uh, thank you so much, presenters. It is really a nice presentation. Uh, my question is that someone who hasn't conceived and uh, they are not yet eligible to start taking the drugs. Uh, there are some drugs like IV thion, like their liver protect and other liver supplements. Would you recommend them for someone to, to, to be getting them? Thank you. Okay, we can have uh, the team respond to those first. I'll start with the first one on the role of, uh, of micro mineral supplementation in patients with chronic liver disease. Um, it is, most of the times, patients with chronic liver disease are suffering malnutrition, and malnutrition alone, malnutrition alone, including micronutrient deficiencies, are independent, uh, uh, are independent factors that can lead to high mortalities because uh, that is a state, most of them are in a, a, a serious state of uh, lack of uh, these micronutrients. However, we should be careful, some nutrients like iron containing uh, supplements and copper containing uh, supplements because these ones are hepatotoxic. So it is okay to give uh, uh, patients uh, supplements like vitamin B12, vitamin C, folate, but we should be careful with the iron. Yes. And the other question on, uh, or, or, or on discordance, in our setting, if we are able, or in any setting where you are able to demonstrate the presence of the immunoglobulin G to the surface antigen in that, in that woman, or in, in, in the negative partner in the discordant couple, the moment you are able to demonstrate that that person has got the surface and the antibodies to the surface antigen that is called immunization. Then it means that that person is protected. So the discordant couple can occur; they, they can relate normally. They don't have to use condoms when they are having uh, the situation. They don't have to. Don't worry about that. However, in our city, we are not able to. We are not able to do do that uh, surface antigen. I mean that that antibody test. But we know that. Um, for those people who are, 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 are negative, most likely they acquired the infection, but they were able to mount a natural immune response. So they, we have uh, immunoglobulin already in our body. Yes, immunoglobulin G. Yeah. No, there is no PrEP so far. There's no PrEP for, for, for hepatitis. There is no PrEP and the, the, the PrEP is the immunization. Uh, Dr. Lalu, any more questions? Yes, yes, yes. There was a question from Arik Mawian. Uh, I think this was to, to Jasper that in the event someone was hepatitis B positive, and then after some time they test negative. Um, I think I'm looking at an acute infection. Would this person qualify for the vaccine after testing negative? That was one of his questions. I think he had another, another question regarding the cure. I think Dr. Doctor Boy tried to re reply. I don't know if uh, there's anything more from the team. And then uh, there was another question from <clears throat> Amono Lucy. She, she gave a scenario that a client tests hepatitis B negative and was given first and second doses respectively. After five months, she went to another facility and tests positive. What comments can we say on that? And then... Uh, there was one again from St Stephen Mambui. He said, how can the virus for hepatitis be, be monitored? And what is the criteria or eligibility for someone to start the ARVs? I think this was answered during the, the 
the session. How do we manage a couple with hepatitis B surface A positive man and the mother negative, and a negative mother who is fully vaccinated? That is from Cherry Tonic. And the final one for now is uh, that from Cephas Caroline. How frequent is seroconversion after vaccination? When a healthy carrier gets pregnant, do you initiate treatment regardless of the APRI score? What is the prevalence of progression to cirrhosis during pregnancy? Over to you, Richard. Oh. Okay. Milton, go ahead and respond. Okay, let, let me respond to the question. The first one on someone who tests positive with hepatitis surface antigen and later on test the surface antigen. I, I should say very, very, very rare someone to test positive initially for the surface antigen and then later on test negative. And if they have turned negative after a surface antigen uh, positive, what does it mean? It means that that person has formed immunoglobulins against the surface antigen. So they do not need a vaccination because they have produced immunoglobulins that can protect them against the surface antigen. Now, the other question was, uh, someone tested hepatitis surface antigen negative, then after five months, they tested uh, positive. Uh, now, the, 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 the vaccine is a recombinant of a surface antigen, which will persist at least for this month. So this, this person tested early. This person tested early. The other question was to do with the uh, discordance we responded to, to that. And the frequency of seroconversion after vaccination is a bit, the question is not clear. Someone was initially positive and then they start negative. So you don't need to vaccinate people who are positive. So the question is a bit uh, not clear. Those are the ones I still remember. Yes, there seems to be a hand from Charles. Is that the last hand? Yes, that will be the last hand. Charles, are you able to unmute and ask your question? Okay, it seems uh, Charles is not there. We huh? could, uh, Charles, yes. yes? Yes, my question is about a scenario, eh? uh, about a mother who is already HIV positive, is pregnant and you may test hepatitis B is positive. How do you go about that when you get such a scenario? Thank you. And also to add on, eh? supposing that very mother is on a TDF based combination, RVs. Yes, thank, thank you, Charles, for that question. Uh, the mother who is, a, who is HIV positive and then comes to a mental clinic and you do the surface antigen and it is, uh, uh, it is positive and she's already on ARVs for treating, uh, managing HIV and she's on uh, a TDF-based combination. Uh, you just continue the treatment throughout uh, her pregnancy. There is no harm in continuing the treatment throughout her pregnancy. And then you just continue monitoring, like we said, for uh, uh, liver injuries, that, that is the viral loads. You do RFTs uh, for the enotoxicity. You continue with the CBC. You want to know whether you know, she has a good HB from Australia, those things. Uh, so you continue the, 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 the monitoring as you would have done uh, in a normal uh, patient uh, drugs, but uh, no special uh, care you give uh, if she's already on treatment for HIV. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll continue to answer the questions in the chat, but we need to have two, three more presentations and we'll be closing few minutes, we are cognizant of time. So I would like to introduce uh, Sir Imatule Kumbari, one of our specialist midwives here. We're going to talk about some of the dramatic challenges, screening, 
diagnosis and management of hepatitis B, as we've seen, Dr. Charlotte from the UK presented what we aspire to have, and we have also presented what we have in our setting. So how do we get to where they are? Thank you, Dr. Milton, for that introduction. I'm Mashleti Mwari, and I'm going to talk about the programmatic challenges in screening, diagnosis, and management of hepatitis. And uh, good enough, uh, in our country, we have uh, the strategies laid down, we have the plans. So the World Health Organization guided, our country has also guided, so everything is in place. But the thing is, are we getting what we want? So in the guidelines, it was thought out who should do what, what should be done, and when should be done. So everything is very clear. However, there are several challenges that have affected the implementation of recommended interventions. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about some of those uh, challenges. Uh, the first challenge uh, uh, we look at is uh, uh, leadership and commitment is uneven. And uh, true, the viral hepatitis has been elevated to a public health priority. And uh, like I said, we have those national guidelines. But uh, if we look at the, the units, the designated units and budgets within our Ministry of Health to lead, to guide, and to coordinate all those hepatitis responses, really, it, it looks like we have inefficiency, leadership, and commitment to this. Do we get enough money? Uh, are people doing all the works they're supposed to do? Who is there to do LDC? We had a very good presentation from the, uh, the officer from Blood Bank, and we saw all the values were coming in. But when you go to other units, when you go to Antinento, when you go to Labor Suit, do we have values coming in like they came in from Blood Bank? So that means that probably maybe more efforts are needed to reach where we want to reach. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we have uh, inadequate data. And uh, the truth is public health dimensions and the impacts of hepatitis B are poorly understood. We are here talking hepatitis, hepatitis, but we don't have that data which shows that this number of people are affected and this is what they are causing. This is, these are the impacts, these are the negative impacts that we have. So we, it is, well, the problem is there, but it is poorly understood. Why is it poorly understood? Because we don't have the data. So lack of inaccurate statistics regarding the burden hepatitis B infection is a big problem. And uh, lack of, uh, or in that case of such data and weak hepatitis surveillance programs make it so difficult to plan for focused action and to prioritize the allocation of resources. You can't keep saying we have a problem, but people don't see the problem. Will I give you money? I will not give you money. In addition, there is still limited published experience of hepatitis B testing and treatment to inform development of future programs. We have had very good examples in the previous presentations. At some point we're hearing uh, there is conflicting uh, information about this and this. For example, there is conflicting information about uh, the history of hepatitis B pregnancy. Some people say there is no change in the condition. Others are saying uh, it's possible increase or worsening of the condition. So there is really that kind of inadequacy at some point and it is also tying us back to getting our planned uh, goals. The other uh, challenge is the uh, coverage of prevention programs is limited. Uh, so yes, the prevention programs like we are seeing, we talked of uh, every mother that comes from antenatal probably should be tested, but are we testing every mother? So those specific populations that we are looking at, we are saying even if a mother is tested positive, probably you have to go to the villages uh, to her home and test her home, home people, but these are things that are not being done. We are looking at uh, the recommendation of probably vaccinating all newborns within the first 24 hours of birth. But these are things that are not being done. So the coverage of prevention programs is really, really very limited. And uh, there are also a proportion of women who do not come early or they never come at all for antenatal. Some are delivering from the villages. So we don't know what happens to them. We don't know why they don't come. We don't know if we have hepatitis. So it's like, I, ideally, we, we have some gap there. Fine, there could be a small percentage, but if that woman has hepatitis B and she's not coming, she's coming late, she's not even coming for uh, skilled back attendance, we are going to miss out on, on offering our hepatitis services to such mothers. 
The other thing is most people do not know their hepatitis status, which is very true. Uh, they, we heard that uh, if you have 10 Ugandans, nine of them don't know their hepatitis status. And that is a very big, big risk. So lack of public knowledge of the disease, it means we don't know if we are sick or if we are not sick. So targeted testing is not being done effectively. And uh, even in those higher risk groups, uh, we are not doing. Uh, the testing. So if we don't know our our status, if you don't know your status, will you seek uh, treatment? Will you seek any other interventions? You will not. So for this reason, we see that yeah. diagnosis always comes late and uh, appropriate testing to assess liver disease and guide treatment decisions, including when to start treatment or solve them available. So if you're not getting patients, they are coming in quite late. So we have almost intervened, but we are just there to maintain life. Like so earlier around that what is the aim of treating, just to maintain life. So if people don't know their hepatitis status, they not achieve our goals. The other reason is that um, medicines, tests, and diagnostics are unaffordable for most. And uh, true, in our public setting, the costs are supported by the government. But uh, we all know that in most cases, even if you have a super malaria, and you are at a, a government facility, you may get the coatem and you may not get the paracetamol. Or if you get the paracetamol, the coatem is there. So even if we are saying that probably medications could be there, but all these tests we are looking at, all these diagnostics, all these seasonal and periodic assessments that we want, is really the government covering all those costs? No, they are coming back to the patient. And we are saying most of the treatment is actually lifelong. So you're looking at this demand person who is even struggling to get food, and then you're supposed to put this person on that chronic treatment. So at some point, it's also letting us back, especially the diagnostics and the tests. There are too many, but they are very vital. But in most cases, we are using private labs, and some of our clients can't really afford uh, those. The other problem is coming in with uh, as a public health approach to, to hepatitis B. It is really, really lacking. We've seen so many public health approaches in regard to HIV, but here for hepatitis, are we seeing them? We are not seeing such. So we need, we, we lack people-centered health services, and uh, we need to reach out to the populations. Like we have said, if a mother tests positive, we need to go back to the village and trace all her contacts. But these are things that are not being done. We need to involve the communities, uh, we need to have uh, adequate public funding for station interventions and services. We need to have an appropriate trained health workforce. At some place, you, you, when you go to some of the facilities, uh, you find that they say, for us, we test only those mothers that, are, uh, that have signs and symptoms. Uh, for us, we only test mothers who want. For us, we used to test, but uh, the lab uh, complained of overwhelming numbers and we stopped. So do we have those uh, workforce coming up? We have enough numbers or we don't? And uh, if we, we at least approach this problem uh, following the public health approach, probably we could achieve some of our goals. Other problem we, we uh, I looked at is the, the, structural, the structural barriers. Uh, for example, uh, if, if we, we look at uh, gender-based violence, sometimes women or other are not even coming for, for care because of the gender-based violence, the stigma and discrimination. We've just talked about this condense, which is so hard to, to manage in our setting. So some of these things are keeping away our uh, the clients from coming for the services because for them, they think about something else. And for us, we are also not reaching out to them. The other problem is to do with the treatment, uh, the treatments themselves. Uh, this uh, problem is made worse by the absence of effective curative medications. In I think Dr. Uh, yes, one of our presenters talked about why do we treat? And basically the reasons were more of scientific. We want to stop the people from being, so we want to do this. But to that person in the village there who is having chronic, he's having hepatitis. Uh, hepatitis, what is the reason he's giving himself or herself for getting this chronic care? They are putting in a lot of sources, they know they are not going to kill. So you find that at some point they give themselves those reasons that we can never understand, and then they are not coming up to get the effective treatment. 
Then uh, medications that effectively, efficiently suppress viral replication exist, like we've seen. However, it is likely that they do not reach all those who need it. One reason we can confirm this is uh, hepatitis B is largely underorganized. We are looking at, in, in a Ugandan setting, we are looking at about only one person out of 10 who could be knowing their what? Their hepatitis status. The World Health Organization looked at, uh, uh, reported the, uh, a percentage of 5%. People who have chronic hypertension, only 5% know their what? Know their status. So we see that people out there in the villages, they have the condition, but they are not reaching out for treatment. And that is. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation. It is a okay, and we are going to be closing in the next 20 minutes. And I want to take this opportunity. ADHO, she's called ASK. ASK stands for Abigail Stella Chisoro. So you'll ask her all the remaining questions as she tells us the local government perspective for HB implementation. You are not clear, you're breaking. Okay, I was presenting with the mask on, but now I've removed. I hope I'm much clearer now. Okay. Uh, so I first of all wanted you to have this as uh, an introduction of what we had in the district. And this also includes the Mbari Regional Referral Hospital, this data was collected from all the facilities. Now, the next set of the pancakes, if you look at the first uh, pancake, we had 27,954 20, mothers attending first ANC. And of those, only 1,424 managed to test were screened for HBV. And that is about uh, a percentage of about um, um, 5%. Now, and when you look at the second pancake, there were 15 who tested positive. And of these 15, when you go to the third pancake, you realize that most of the mothers that tested positive, only 10 got the treatment. My five mothers did not get that treatment. And even those who got treatment, when you look at the last panic cake, those who got were from the urban setting, followed by the uh, peri-urban. Now, what happened, my question or our concern is, where is the pure rural? Is there a correlation between um, 
services in the urban area versus the rural area. Maybe we shall explore this further. Now the question is, why are my 43 facilities not screening others? And for this, I would probably think that maybe there are factors that are hindering us from screening the mothers. And this I would talk of being a local government. Sometimes uh, we get some of these uh, guidelines right. I, I looked at four things, maybe the guidelines, we have them. If we have them, are they well distributed to the facility? Or are they timely? Our uh, ADH or MCH are the gatekeepers. This time, they are not the gatekeepers of Koboko, but uh, gatekeepers of MNCH activities in the district. So if these are gatekeepers and you tell them to keep the gate without giving them the weapon, the gun, or the arrow and bow, or the bow and the arrow, whatever the case, um, I think we are missing something. The either we get these guidelines very late, by the time you want to implement, they are already revising the, the, the policy guidelines. So I think it could be part of the reason why some of these facilities uh, another screening. And another probable reason why the 43 facilities are not screening could be capacity building. Because um, if somebody doesn't know, then they cannot preach the gospel. They don't know. How can I go down to educate the mothers to screen for HBV when I don't know what it is and how to go about it? And then maybe another issue like my previous, uh, one of the presenters said, could be the supplies, they are, the stockouts are in and out. That could be the reason. And maybe generally like my, my sister said, the sensitization of the public. Sometimes when the public, when the public know the, what they need, they can demand for that service. But if they don't know, then they may not demand for it. I was also asking myself, oh, it can be a question to all of us. Why didn't the five mothers get their treatment? Because we had 15 and five and 10 got treatment and five didn't get treatment. Maybe the people who managed to train stopped their knowledge stopped at that and they didn't know what to do next. And this and I lost these mothers. And I'm also saying, why is it that the 67 who got treatment are from the urban and 33 from Perry urban? So what happened is, because there was about 10% in my data, uh, which were from uh, pure rural, and she's nowhere to be seen. And then uh, last but not least, why mothers who got treatment were not monitored or followed up because there was no evidence, there was no information, maybe they were not eligible or something like that. There was nothing. And from the previous presenters, you saw that actually we needed to monitor these mothers because their treatment is supposed to be uh, somewhat long term. So the recommendation from the local government perspective is, the, and this is from this side of Mbale, I would say, let us build the capacity of the midwives and maybe other um, critical human resource who can give this service, maybe through training, mentorship, or refresher courses, whichever we can do. And then also, I think that we needed to have timely distribution of the policy guidelines to the implementers. Because if we, the implementers are getting the guidelines either late or never, then sometimes we contra, uh, contradict, contradict ourselves because you are, you are starting to implement the previous uh, policy guideline, a new one has come. It is a challenge. And this is not only to the particular guideline on hepatitis B, but applies also to other um, policy guidelines. So people who develop these policies kindly distribute them timely 
for the implementers to do their work very well. And then um, I also recommend that we can work with the implementing partners to ensure that when we have a gap, like in the test kits, right now we have at least other DPTs which are even cheaper. If we could have the implementing partners to chip in whenever there is a, a, a stock out to the eligible facilities that are doing um, the screening. And you realize that uh, this data, when I was considering it, I actually considered data from all the facilities that are screening, are do, providing ANC services. And these facilities, I considered only past ANC to avoid overlap because ANC mothers keep coming back for attendance. And then finally, uh, I recommend that we have a comprehensive and a well-functioning system and e, that is monitoring and evaluation to ensure effectiveness and efficiency of uh, these programs right from the center, the Ministry of Health, the region, and down to the lowest health facility. I feel that when we do all this, uh, we shall be somewhere. Thank you. Uh, uh, ask uh, Emmanuel. I don't know if there are one or two questions, but if there are none, we could have a wrap up and we call it a return it to you, Secretariat. I think let's have a wrap up. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, the Dean, Professor Julius Wandawa, to give us a wrap up on this issue so that uh, we can conclude this session. Thank you very much, the organizers. We are happy to participate in this management of uh, hepatitis B virus. I want to thank the organizers from the secretariat and our, our participants here, they have done a very nice job. And I think the take home message, which we need to, to say is that we have an opportunity that when women come to that NATO clinic, or they come to the labor ward in the hospitals or health units, that we can intervene using the developed guidelines for Uganda, so that we can actually manage and prevent hepatitis B virus. Because we know that if the 97% of our women attend at NATO, we can screen the 97% of our women who attend at NATO and manage those who have hepatitis. And then we screen the mothers who come in the labor, in the labor, in the labor especially those who have had a missed opportunity and didn't attend at NATO, and we screen them. And then we immunize the babies. After that, I think we shall go a long way, join our colleagues in UK and in developed countries with the, with the percent with the hepatitis B virus percentage below 1%. And I thank you all for participating and coming asking us to participate in this presentation, which has been very, very good. Okay. Thank you very much, our elder, Professor Wanwaba. Let me take this opportunity to thank the NASMEC Secretariat for considering the team in Bari. And uh, more importantly, thank the team in Bari that have put this presentation together. I think they have a hand clap. And then uh, finally, thank uh, Professor Oo of uh, Bari Clinical Research Institute, who has graciously provided us his boardroom and the internet facilities for us to reach the rest of the country and the world. Over to you, Emmanuel and the Secretariat. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a wonderful session. We want to thank our participants who have, who have, who have remained with us up to the very end. We, he did apologize for the over, over short in time. And uh, we do acknowledge that I uh, will do better next time. Uh, just a few announcements. The next webinar will be on the last Thursday of next month. So I think Richard will give us details on that. Uh, then we'll share the slides with uh, everyone registered on the, on the 
Okay. On the Thank portal. Uh, the second was to ask the people. Pre Kindly, can I hand over to Richard? Richard, you can give more announcements and, and, and we end the Brian. session. Thank you. Uh, so just to note that the next webinar is on uh, breastfeeding, as we'll be commemorating the breastfeeding week uh, in the next month. It will be on 26th of July, of August, sorry. Same time, 2 p.m. and we'll, uh, we'll be sending out an email. Invitation. We want to thank the team from Bositema. Thank you very, very much for putting up a wonderful webinar. We thank Dr. Charlotte, a uh, patient from the UK for sharing the experience. It has indeed uh, been a great learning experience. Thank you, everyone. You can check out the email from NASMEC. Uh, it is nasmecug at uh, gmail.com where we share the recordings and the presentations. We also have a YouTube channel, just Google National Safe Motherhood webinars. You'll be able to land on our YouTube channel where we put these recordings and the previous recordings. You can pick and watch them from there. Thank you very much, Tim. Have a good evening.